free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. It's Tuesday, August 6th, 2019. Hope you're having a nice summer. We're getting a bit of a reprieve here in the Northeast. Actually sat outside last night in our yard with the fire pit on. And if you listen to the podcast, you know that I am not a summer guy. I am a give me some crisp weather kind of guy. So we had a little semblance of um, of what, what's to come. So or, or a little uh, indication of what's to come. So so I was pretty pleased with that. But um, I was uh, I was thinking we we bought a new car and uh, that this past week. And I have to tell you that the whole experience. I don't know why it gives me gives me such, <laughs> it shortens my patience and the angst knowing that I'm going to have to, to go through the process. I mean, it, sometimes we know what we want. We just go get it. Um, but this time after, uh, having, uh, my wife, she likes, you know, she's hauling kids around town and, and, uh, I'm often, uh, taking my son, uh, on road trips for travel across. And then we have, um, you know, just a, just a, they have a lot of friends, a lot of kids, and and so seven seats is something that was important to my wife. Minivans are out. She's anti minivan. My kids are anti minivan. So uh, so it was. We were looking, and uh, our last our last car uh, we've had like I think three, uh, or my wife's car. Uh, she 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 settled on the Buick Enclave, and when we first bought it, I think it was. Uh, maybe it was two, two times we've gone back to the well on that one. Uh, but you know, you, you think Buick, you're like, Oh God, my, my, you know, your, your father is Buick. Uh, but, um, they've, they've, they've come a long way. They've done a nice job, but they have easy access. They have captain seats in the second row. So you could walk right back to the third row in there. You know, it's, it's spacious, but, um, but this time around, you know, uh, the kid said, why don't, why don't you just go? Uh, when we, we were in, uh, LA f- a few months ago for vacation, we rented a Mercedes SUV for the, for the week and the kids liked it. My wife liked it. And, um, so, so then we said, all right, well, if we're going to do that, the kids said, well, I'll just go look at the BMWs and the Audis. Said, okay. And I've had BMWs in the past and, um, we thought maybe Volvo. So we said, you know, let's take a fresh look at what we want to get. And, uh, I, I just hate the car shopping experience. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't like being sold to, I, I like being advised <laughs> or, or consulted and, um, and I appreciate, I absolutely appreciate people have a job to do. And it's gotta be hard being a sales car salesperson now because a lot, most people I'm sure are at least take a little bit of time to educate themselves as to what's out there with the internet. You can do a lot of comparison shopping and reviews and all that stuff. Um, but it was interesting a few times my, my wife uh, popped into a dealer where if I couldn't get there with her, she'd pop in and, and my wife's a very educated woman. And she, um, she would come home and say, I, I, I want to scream. She said, if I was called honey or sweetie one more time and people talk down to me, like they think I'm a dummy. And, um, and my wife's the brains of my household. So, um, you know, it, 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 it was so right away. I mean, a guy would lose interest and she'd say, okay, well, if we're going to look at this brand, we're going to a different dealer. Um, so anyway, we looked at them all and, uh, went, looked at the Mercedes, the BMWs, the Audis, the Volvos, and you name it. We're back to the Buick Enclave. It was, um, it was, it was just for us. It was great where you get the, all the others are, I mean, obviously they're, they're very nice cars, uh, safe, um, good quality, but the, the price disparity was crazy when you look at the access, what we really wanted. I know it sounds ridiculous, but the, the most important thing was how do we get, you know, five or six kids into that car um, with ease where they don't have to, uh, you know, do gymnastics to get into that third row. And um, and the Enclave made some really nice upgrades. It was getting a little, little um, uh, 
the look, the last model wasn't that great, but they, they did a nice job on the look inside and the, uh, on outside and on the inside. It, 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 they made it look extremely nice. And we sat in the car and said, the new one, because that was the last one we went and looked at, and said, wow, I mean, this isn't that far behind the others. And, and you know, it's a, it's a, uh, basically a $40,000 difference in the price of the car. So uh, that was, that was uh, past week. Uh, but I walk in, when I walk in, I say, listen, guys, sorry. Um, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers guy for a living and here's what I know, um, in terms of pricing and so on and so forth. And, um, I try and shortcut it a little bit and, um, it, it's the whole process just gives me angst. Anyway, got our new car. Um, I was thinking, you know, I think you all know that all know, listen to me, that's so presumptuous. I sound like a jackass. Um, for those of you who do listen to the podcast, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a New York sports guy. Now, interestingly, I'm not a fan of living in New York. Uh, we live here by default. My wife's family is here. <laughs> um, I'm from, we're both from here, uh, but I, there, I'd, I'd live a thousand other places. Uh, and I, I think so with my wife now, but the kids are ingrained in, in middle and high school. So, you know, until they're out, we're not going anywhere. But, um, but, uh, I, I grew up a, just a diehard, uh, Met Islander, uh, and Jet fan and Nick fan. Um, and being a New York sports fan is tough because most of their teams suck. Um, unless you were an Islander fan in the eighties. Um, but, but you, you know, you come into every season holding out hope and, uh, I mean, the Mets were in the World Series a few years ago, uh, but the Mets came into this season with a lot of promise. And uh, over a uh, new GM who used to be a sports agent came in as a general manager, uh, a pretty cocky guy, um, and was very confident, called the Mets the team to beat. And uh, after, at the halfway mark, the Mets were about 11 games under 500. And for those of you who are not baseball fans or don't watch a lot of it, that that's poor. Uh, 500 being, you know, uh, 50, 50, uh, on your record, but they were, they were, uh, <clears throat> well below and struggling. They couldn't get out of their own way going into the all-star break, which is about the halfway mark of the season. And it's interesting because I, I was thinking of how sports equates to, to the, the capital markets and stocks. Um, <clears throat> I am a, uh, I am an avid listener of sports radio. And again, it, I don't know why, because it drives me nuts. But I think it's 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 entertainment value. But I've been listening to WFAN radio here in New York, which is uh, probably one of the first sports stations in the in the country, and it's big, and it's I think it's probably the largest. Um, and I've been listening since since it came on the air, I think, in the late '80s. Uh, and um, and the format is, you know, they have their different hosts, and many of them are here for many years. And then there, it's a call-in format. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting to hear you now the uh, the hosts, you know, they're they're Met or Yankee fans, and and the fans obviously in New York, they're Met or Yankee fans, and the Yankees are having a great season. But as the as the as as the season wore on, <clears throat> you know, the Mets fans are calling up, just hammering the new GM, the, the general manager. Uh, his, on his first year on his job, he made a, a, a trade that didn't look good uh, so early in the season and, and probably still not great so far, uh, calling for the manager's ousting his second year in. Uh, this guy's a bum. That guy's a bum. The other guy's a bum. They need to do this, this and this con- a constant barrage. And if you're if you're not from here or if you've uh, but if but if you visited here or you hear people and. You know, you get some of these funky New York accents, uh, which can just, you know, it's like nails on a chalkboard. But when you're from here, you just kind of get a chuckle out of it. So, uh, but but people get outraged and there's debates and fights on the radio. And, you know, I'm in the car a fair amount, so I'm listening to it and, and I get a chuckle. I've never once called in. I, in, 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 I don't know what, 30 years I've never called, 30 plus years I've never called in. Uh, but I, I listen a lot. And uh, so so now all of a sudden the All-Star game comes and the Mets are, uh, they couldn't couldn't get to the break fast enough. They get, you know, three or four days off, the, the league does. And uh, since the All-Star break, the Mets have the best record in baseball. 
the pitching staff is doing the uh, has the lowest earned run average in baseball. Uh, and uh, there are 17 wins and six losses. <clears throat> and they're back in uh, the playoff race for the end of the season. And there's uh, 50 games to go, maybe. And uh, so as you now all of a sudden, the sports radio is lighting up with with excitement. Right. And it's everyone. Everyone loves it. And Mickey Calloway, the manager, now he's doing a pretty good job. And Brody Van Wagen, the GM, and his his plan is starting to come together. And the guy who was in the slump earlier in the season, now he's really starting to turn around and start to hit. And, and everyone gets excited. And I, as I listen to it, I think of investing. I think of momentum investing. I think of headline watching and headline reading and reacting. And, you know, the baseball season is 162 games. It's a long season. I mean, they get to spring training. The pitchers and catchers get there in the middle of February. In March, <clears throat> all of March and a little bit of April, the fields in, in, in Florida and Arizona have spring training, right? It's a, it's a rite of passage for, for a lot of kids in America growing up. You go to a spring training game, right? Family vacations down to spring training, um, and, uh, you know, in the warmth, you come from the North, you go down for a week into the South and, and, or the Southwest and you watch uh, the guys getting ready for the season. And then they, the season starts in early April and they go through the end of September and playoffs go into October, 162 games playing. And then you get through the summer, the dog days of August, uh, where it's, it's brutal and you know, they're playing back to back and people might look at, at a baseball game, say, yeah, they stand around a lot. It, it, yes, but as, as I, I played a lot of baseball and, and it, it takes a toll on your body after a while, you know, because it's a lot of fast twitch, start, stop, uh, you know, sudden bursts and, and your body as a player can, can, can start to wear down over a long season. <clears throat> so the but the similarities, I think about what I read on Twitter or what CNBC or what talk, uh, financial radio has. It's all headline driven. Right. There's it's as though you're supposed to perform today. It's 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 it acts as though the world is linear. The season is linear. You should if you have a good team on paper, you should just have a great season. That's it. Uh, you should go wire to wire and lead the league, lead your comp, lead your division. Same thing with a company. Right. That's, uh, you know, they're, they're geez, it's a company. They have 10,000, 5,000, 20,000 employees or an industry that's going through a a dynamic change. It, it should go just like it gets planned, right? Wrong. That's not how it works. And like those people calling in, calling for Mickey Calloway and Brody Van Wagenen's job. And this guy's a bum and that guy's a bum. The other guy should be benched. <clears throat> it's just like with, with a company. Now, if you're, if you have a, a, a value or a deep value or a contrarian investment style, what you're trying to look for is the Mets when they're 11 or 12 games under 500. A, you're looking for a, a talented roster. If you're if you're looking at baseball, talented roster, but stumbling and struggling and can't figure it out. Something's wrong. They something's not firing right. But it 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 has the it has the the core to 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 do something right. If you're a deep value investor, you're looking for a business that stumbled. It could be in a deeply cyclical industry where supply and demand needs to work itself out <clears throat> and it's trying to sort its way around the bottom. Or it could be a, a more linear, a, a more secular type business, uh, secular being more and more of less, less cyclical, but it could have stumbled. It could be self-inflicted. It could be temporary industry conditions and it's down and you, you buy it. And uh, you buy you, you, and you're looking to buy value. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to turn around right away. It doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. But in, in the world of investing, you should be looking at what's your risk reward? What, what's my potential upside from this investment opportunity? And what's my potential downside? So what's my risk? How much percent down? And what's my reward? How much percent up? And then if you have that stacked in your favor, then you wait, right? So, some, in, some, some investments, 
in some really deeply cyclical industries, you can see things get so out of whack because it's emotion, right? Where on sports radio, the, the guy calling in can't make the trade he wants to. He can't fire the general manager. So he's got to sit and he's got to wait. And he could either choose to stay a fan of that team or he could not. He could leave. Go find another team. That typically doesn't happen in sports, but but it can. But but and as something, but but there's but there to listen to sports radio. There's so much raw emotion, and people <laughs> can't sleep, and they want to throw. But there's no their money's not at risk. Only their their entertainment. In the world of investing, when people are investing their own money, that's even at a whole different level. And then they're getting bombarded with the financial media, with Twitter and debates and the message boards. And now when their own money is at risk, uh, they, now the emotion takes over at a whole different level. And when that, when that, just like when the Mets are 12 games under 500, when, when your stock is down 20, 25%, you know, the, the, whatever, or pick a number. <clears throat> if you haven't done the analysis or spent the time to understand what your risk reward is right? and follow price action. Stocks down 20%. I must be wrong. I'm, and, and then you listen to the people when it's down 20%, everyone is piling on. If it, right, sports radios, you're 12 games under 500, fire the bum, get rid of them, change the roster. When stocks down 20, 25%, fire them. Fire the CEO. Something must be wrong. I made a mistake in the investment is what people's logic tends to be. But it's all driven by emotion. It's driven by price action. Price action in sports is your record. But it's a long season. What's your, think about it now, all of a sudden, the Mets have the best record in the second half. And, and like I said, you should hear sports radio. You should see the, the columnists writing their stuff. Three weeks ago, this team was written off for dead. And they put one win together and another and another. Then they lost the game. Then they won three or four more. Then they lost one. But now the, now the momentum's picking up. On the team, you can see the confidence. In situations where they weren't performing in clutch situations, now they are. And you, you, you watch the games at City Field and you could feel the excitement through the TV. You could hear the buzz if you were watching that game four or five weeks ago, you crickets and it's, it's, it's here. So nothing's changed. Uh, the talent's the same, the GM's the same, the manager's the same. Uh, but it's a long season and things happen. <clears throat> and, 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 and an educated fan looks at it and says, okay, well, let's take a look. Uh, here's the roster. These guys, most of them, not all, but most of them have a body of work over a period of years. And sure, sometimes people have career years, sometimes they have terrible years, but for the most part, they're, they're going to start to get it together. Like investing. Why did I make this investment? What was the risk reward? Did I think it could go down 20, 25, 30%, whatever industry company you're looking at? <clears throat> if that's what you thought it could get, when it gets there, you want to understand why did it get there? Was it market driven? Was it fear driven? Did they, did they stumble? Did they lie? Did they not say what they were going to do? I mean, if, if, if you have companies that if your original thesis was wrong and that happens, it's definitely going to happen. If your thesis is wrong and you have to look for a new reason to own it, then you sell the stock. That's called thesis creep. Right? You, get, you have a thesis, you have a risk reward, it gets down to your certain price level, you were wrong, it gets there, you, you re-examine and say, is my thesis hold? Yes. Is there a reason why it could go down further? Maybe. Um, uh, probability weight that. But, but is the reason that I saw and is the same risk reward intact? Then you got to filter out the noise. Think about being Mickey Calloway, the manager of the Mets. Or if, if you're if you're in the lineup and you're playing and you're having a tough season, if you're listening to the press, if you're listening to the fans, especially in New York, I mean, if you're playing in Kansas City, great city, by the way, but if you're playing in Kansas City and you have three reporters in the locker room, if you're playing in New York after a game, you got 20, right? You're getting bombarded with questions. But if, if you're on that field and you're struggling and you were to listen to the press and let the pressure get to you, you're going to, you're going to press and you're going to make more mistakes. If you're an investor, 
and you are following price action and you see the, and, and you're listening to sports radio or the equivalent of uh, <clears throat> Twitter, CNBC, Bloomberg, and you're listening to the guy who came on, the portfolio manager who you don't know from Adam, you don't know anything about him, you have no idea if he's good or if he sucks, but he, he's pitching something and it might be counter to what your view is and you're like, oh my God, I'm wrong. <clears throat> you can't do that. You have to understand what you own, why you own it, what the risk reward is. If it, if, it, if it drops down, you need to understand what your thesis was. If your thesis has proved incorrect, then you sell. If not, you might have an even better opportunity than you did. But you can't let the emotions of the moment, it's a long haul. If you are a deep value contrarian investor and in any deeply cyclical industry, you're got to be playing the long game. You got to know that going in and price action is, it shouldn't dictate what your, what your decision making is. That's already got to be factored into your risk reward. So anyway, I thought it was a very interesting comparison as we are seeing it swing now, because now what's happening is the bandwagon starting. Everyone's jumping on the bandwagon, the Met bandwagon. You know, we always thought that uh, they were finally get it together. I, I sensed, uh, you know, you listen to call in shows, you know, Vinny from Brooklyn. Yeah, I was kind of sensing that it was turning. I knew I told my friends, you just got to hang in there. Okay. Sure you did. Right? Because you remember these same callers. And I'm picking a name. I'm making up a name. You know, it could be anyone from anywhere. But you, you remember these names. And the same guys who are now jumping up and down about how good it was three, four weeks ago, they were calling in saying, fire the bums. So, you know, emotions can play a part in it. And you just have to filter out the emotions. And, you know, we're going to, I, I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of guys coming on the podcast in the interview uh, that we're going to bring on now. And uh, uh, you, you've heard both of them before. They're two friends of mine, Chris McIntosh and Harris Cuppy Cupperman. And uh, before the interview and during it, you'll hear, you know, Chris always says, hey, the greatest risk in any market is linear thinking in a, in a dynamic world. And he, he was talking about, he says, you know, it's so crazy right now. The stuff that's most critical to, to civilization, energy, is the cheapest it's ever been on a relative basis. Yet it's out of favor. If it were baseball, they'd have, they'd be playing, they'd, they'd have a 12, 15, 20 game under 500 record. But is it going to turn? I don't know. Let's, 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 let's hear what the guys have to say. Mac Cuppy, welcome to the podcast. Hey there. Hey man. So, I, you know, I was thinking, you know, we, we talk frequently and, um, wouldn't it be nice to give a window into people listening on the podcast? Because if they heard our conversations, they just think we're three grumpy old men, uh, just little curmudgeons who don't, you know, l live on the, deep, deep value side on the long side and think everything is, is crazy on the growth side, on the short side that, and uh, I thought, you know what, let's, let's bring them in into one of our conversations. So I'm going to, Chris, let's start with you. Let's, let's, let what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with the investing world as you see it? What are some of the bigger things that, that sit in your craw on a regular basis? And where are some of the opportunities because of that, that you think are occurring right now? Jesus, where to start? Jump in any time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if you're going to encapsulate it into one thing, Mike, it's a it's a narrative we will have deflation up the wazoo until kingdom come, and nothing's going to stop that. I think that's the kind of prevailing narrative. If you, I guess, you and then everything rolls off of the back of that. So, if you think that that is true and that's what the world is going to look like, um, then well you're not going to be um, expectant of anything that would produce inflation. <clears throat> um, and um, the only, the only way you really make money in that sort of market is, um, is how you've made it in the last decade, right? Which is, um, <clears throat> you know, you buy shit like Tesla and what we work and beyond meat and anything that actually um, acquires market share, preferably if they do so at a massive loss. Um, because then 
Uh, the, the greater the loss is probably the better, um, it, that's the better model because they're acquiring more market share than their competitors. And, um, and well, so you kind of got this. Let me just stop you there for a second. So, and Cuppy, you jump in. So you guys, like me, are were around for the dot-com era and you saw businesses being valued on a per eyeball basis. And uh, at the time, when we were short these things, it, it was painful. But you'd look and say, there's got to be some common sense that comes back to the market and eventually it did but let's but here your your bigger growth companies the more they lose the the more they uh the more the market appreciation appreciates it because they they keep growing and and there is like this they almost get a free pass that you have to grow and everyone goes to amazon by the way well look what amazon did um you know in the early days you're losing money and that's just part of it and you're going to eventually catch up to it how do you guys respond to that cuppy when you look at the, the so Uber's let me talk about Amazon because I think there's a lot of uh, mistakes about what Amazon was. And mind you, in 2002, I made a basket of bombed out dot coms, and I owned some Amazon, and it yep. about tripled, and I sold it, and I felt really smart about myself, and I think I sold it at about 25. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great trade. Phenomenal trade, actually. Um, but when you look at Amazon, keep in mind back then they didn't have AWS; it was just a retailer. And as they grew, they had negative working capital. So their own vendors funded them. And the losses, yeah, they lost some money. Everyone remembers that. And they had some converts and people were worried that they wouldn't pay them off. But you know, their losses were in the tens and at worst hundreds of millions. I don't have it in front of me, but I doubt they lost fully a billion dollars uh, at the worst of it all. And you know, then they inflected, and for about a decade, they ran the business sort of break even. You know, some quarters were up, some were down, but it was kind of a break evenish sort of thing where, from a working capital standpoint, someone else was funding them. So, from a cash basis, they had plenty of cash coming in. And so, that, that's the Amazon story. I, they, they really didn't lose that much money. Everyone has this view that Amazon, you know, lost as much as Tesla and it eventually hockey sticked, but that's not really the truth. Amazon kind of ran break even and used vendor financing to you know, reinvest in the business and grow. I mean, then you look at some of these other things like, you know, well, Tesla's the most obvious. I mean, they just literally light money on fire. And the more money they light on fire, the more excited people get. Like they, they, they've lost money at four diff three different car models they produced and everyone's excited that they're going to come out with a pickup truck now. Like pe people lost their mind. But it seemed right, but that you're right. They go back and reference that, and everyone gets gets pointed to the the, the initial unicorn in the market, and and everyone says, well, if they did it, you know, that that's okay. So so how do you get how how are you, uh, Cuppy? How do you in a market where it's been hard to make money as a value investor uh, for quite some time now, right? It, it's impossible. Uh, passive investing has taken over. It's it's almost impossible. And, and and anything that has growth, whether losses be damned. So how do you navigate the markets in this environment? Oh, wow. Um, look, I, I've, I've been up the last few years, which I'm kind of proud yep. of because uh, a lot of value guys haven't. Um, there's lots of ways to think of value. And you know, I've been finding stuff that's just so bombed out that it really can't go any lower, like the Amias of the world, or I've found some growth stuff. I mean, in a, in a world where everyone's starved for growth and bid these things to crazy prices, you know, I've had winners with you know, the Joint or Viamed. I mean, I bought Viamed at three times earnings. Like, it was growing fast. You couldn't lose money, really. It, that opportunity lasted about a month. I bought as many shares as I possibly could. Like, th right. there, were, there were many days where I was, you know, like a third of the volume. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's still places with this opportunity because the markets aren't that efficient still. I know people claim they are, but they're not. And you do have inflections in various markets and, you know, there's things you could do. Like I, I caught a huge win in Scorpio tankers because, you know, the, the computers can't see forward and see this IMO 2020 thing that's about to hit them over the head in Q4. And so you, this stuff you can do, you just got to work harder and think smarter about it. But the worst possible thing you could do is buy a company at three times earnings with a bunch of cash flow and a buyback because the market hates that. Yeah, right. Exactly. How about you, Chris? What do you, how do you think once one who is a contrarian, one who has a value bent, what do you, what opportunities do you see? And I know some of the things we've talked about is, is you know we've talked about how the shale plays don't make sense and and you've been very attracted to to offshore oil and gas could you kind of walk through what your reasoning is there 
Well, <clears throat> look, if you go back and you think about what's worked, it's, it's been this, this idea that you can have a business where you basically go out and you, you, you know, you sell hundred dollar bills for 90 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to lose 10 bucks on, on every trade, but you're going to do a shit ton of volume, right? Because who doesn't want that deal? And so everybody that walks into your shop is going to buy your deal because <clears throat> they make money, but you're going to do massive volume and your user growth is going to go up the wazoo. You're going to look like a Twitter or an Uber or something like that. And, um, and then ultimately you can go and you can call in Goldman's and um, do an IPO and the sucker is going to go out the door and you can just leave it to the dumb retail bag holders. That's kind of pretty much been the business model. And when, when that's taking place, um, the idea of going into something that is much, much longer term in nature um, becomes less attractive. And so if you think about the stuff that, in, that, that requires um, significant capital expenditure and, you know, Cuppy just mentioned Scorpio, which is, you know, in the shipping space and shipping has been decimated. Um, and, you know, there's, there's very, very little ability to actually finance um, in the shipping industry. In fact, um, there's very few analysts that are left in that space. And um, there's even now protocols against um, actually financing for many of these large institutions. And part of that's around the whole fossil fuel. We're all going to you know, die because some fucking 15 year old teenager in Sweden says that that's the case. And we're all listening to her for some <laughs> goddamn reason. Um, but the other is just that there's, there's no, um, there's no critical thinking around this stuff. And, and it, you know, it's very, very difficult. Any, anything that is capital intensive and that then feeds us into the energy space um, requires a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of capital and it requires a lot of time because you can't turn the stuff on very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I'm not really sure what it is that's driven the market, but market's um, attention span so low. Maybe it's, you know, a combination of social media and um, gaming. And I don't really know what, but I do know this. I do know that back in the 70s or I think it was the 80s, the average holding period for an equity was 10 years. And today it's under four months. Now, all of us guys on this call know very well that, the the fortunes or lack of fortune for any particular company does not change in four months unless you get yep. hit by a tsunami or something of that nature it just does not happen and so you think well if that's the case then why the hell are people moving in and out of their positions in such a short time frame and and it kind of comes back to this um you know this market that we have today where you know, people will be buying beyond meat because it's it's running across the headlines, or they'll be on, you know, waiting for WeWork to list, or they're buying Tesla or, or something like that because there's a lot of media coverage around it, um, and and that's all fine and well, and I think by and large all of us tend to just ignore that. We like we just sit and laugh at it, but we don't typically go against it because it's pretty hard to go against a tidal wave of of, um, of um, of perception <clears throat> and so you look at what doesn't get attention in that environment and what hasn't got attention again everything that's basically got huge capex incidentally it's a lot um, a lot of stuff in the energy space and so you know <clears throat> mike you've done a, a an enormous amount of work um in uranium space and certainly i've never met anybody that's done um more detailed analysis and fully understood that market than you have um, but you've got the similar sort of dynamics there as as you have it really across much of the energy space yeah. so like i guess i'm looking at a lot of things across that space i mean again you know i mentioned um our crazy little teenager in sweden but you've got this whole idea and it's across the western world that we're going to for example remove ice vehicles by and you can pick your target zone, you know, for some of them, it's 2030, some of them, it's 2025, some countries it's 2040. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we sat down here at, um, at HQ and, and we did some numbers on what exactly that would mean if 
any of these countries hit those sorts of protocols. And it's just absurd. I mean, if we, we there's actually a study that came out by um, a bunch of uh, scientists at uh, university in, in Britain. <clears throat> um, I can't remember the university name off the top of my head now. In any event, <coughs> excuse me, they said, okay, Britain's just declared that they're going to, you know, get rid of fossil fuel cars and all this fun stuff by 2030. What does that actually mean? And they ran through the numbers. And it, what, it, what it meant was like the requirements for the materials that would go into electrification um, just for Britain. And like Britain's kind of small if you, if you take the aggregate, which is all of Europe. It's much of, you know, um, Denmark, Sweden, a lot of the Scandinavian countries have all come out with these initiatives where they're saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get rid of this and this is what we're going to do by this date. Let's go. And um, so, so if you bring it down and you just look at Britain, what it meant was things like um, copper production had to, we, they were going to consume like all the copper for an annual supply. They were going to consume like 50% um, of all the cobalt that gets produced. They were going to consume, um, there was a bunch of rare earths, like one of them was like three times annual supply, you know, things like this. And that's just Britain. So you look at this and you go, okay, well, one or two things are going to happen. Maybe if this is true, we're all like, we're just not going to need oil. We're not going to need natural gas. And we're not going to need, um, you know, coal, or any of these fossil fuels. We're just going to run it on, on uh, you know, battery technology, which ultimately comes from the electricity. <clears throat> so that's fine. Then, then, then the prices of all those goods is, is going to have to not just skyrocket, but like literally do what cryptos did seriously, you know? Um, and so, uh, um, that's then makes them extremely uneconomical. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that we'd have a massive, massive global recession, if not depression, just because energy and, and the transportation of goods and services is, is massive and it impacts every single good and service that, um, that we all consume. So you say, okay, well, that's probably not going to happen. Um, well, if that's not going to happen, then the, the current status of what you, what, what people, or the, or the, how the markets are viewing the, should we call it traditional energy space, is completely out of whack. And this is, this is without saying, you know, what the electricity side of things looks like. Because again, if you're going to charge all your bloody batteries and you, you do somehow manage to get all of the copper and the, nickel and the cobalt and everything else let's just pretend that you somehow got that well you still need electricity so where's that going to come from you know so so um that's one of the most um exciting places for us um is is looking at that entire spectrum and and what are your thoughts on the shale plays and cuppy uh, jump in here feel free well shells just shells <laughs> I think to a certain extent, shale's like similar to, you know, what you had in the uranium space with respect to underfeeding. Like it's, it's, yep. it's extra supply, but, but it's coming from something that people have viewed this now as a linear, um, on a linear time frame. Firstly, they think that the, they've, they've viewed, and we, we know this by looking at the fucking junk bonds, right? Because yep. <clears throat> um, they, the way that those things were originally priced was that they were akin to finding a Gawa or a North Sea or something of that nature, which has substantially different decline rates. And so the way that those bonds were priced was, was as if you found a traditional um, oil field. And now we're finding that that's all garbage. You know, most of these things are trading way below par. So, right. um, and, and that, you know, it's been, you know, I were talking about this copy, what's it been a couple of years since there's been a junk bond issued in the shale space? I mean, it's there's basically been, the market. There's been two quite. or three, but there's been no equity issued at all in like two or three years now. There's been like a handful of junk bonds. Basically, people have woken up and said, aha, this business model doesn't make sense. Yes, you could produce a lot of oil, but it's not economic. And when you look at a lot of these uh, uh, companies and, you know, when oil was at much higher prices, they lost money. When oil is at lower prices, they lose more money. The accounting is very confusing. I mean, oil accounting in general is 
yep. based on if you trust the reserve engineer or not. <laughs> and what we've learned is that you can't trust most reserve engineers, go figure. Um, so you're having a lot of these guys um, miss targets. And you know when you're on the hamster wheel where you have to keep drilling in order to keep your production flat and you have to drill more to grow, as soon as you stop drilling, and this is the problem, I mean, when you think about it, like guys like me are looking at these things and saying, why are you guys drilling? You're, you know, you're putting a dollar into the ground, you're getting 75 cents out, and you're paying 9% interest rates to do it. Why don't you just put your uh, assets into runoff, pay off some debt, slow down, wait for higher pricing? I mean, the great thing about uh, shale, when you think of it logically, is that at today's commodity prices, you don't make any money. So what you should do is wait for higher commodity prices. And because yep. of the short uh, time span between uh, when you sput a well and you start producing, I mean, you could literally just hedge it. So oil goes to 75, you lock in a bunch of future production with a hedge. Now you go and you drill it and you kind of know where you're going to be. And you know, you have some margin of error and still actually make money. Why these guys keep drilling, even though they don't make any money today, is that if they don't drill, suddenly their EBITDAX goes negative. Yep. And when yep. your EBITDAX goes, suddenly your borrowing base goes, which means you can't drill any more wells because the banks are looking at this EBITDAX number and they're not looking at other metrics as much. So you really can't get off the hamster wheel ever. And besides, you know, you, the bigger your EBITDAX is, the bigger your annual bonus is. So why would any CEO ever try to get off the, the hamster mill? Uh, right. It's in their DNA. Grow, grow, grow. Production grows. And, and they've been financed, right? I mean, thank you, zero interest rate policy. I mean, it, but you, it's you see these. You see these guys, you know, they, they trade down from 20 a share to a dollar a share. And, you know, you, you, you go on the conference call and you're like, so these guys are obviously going to, you know, cut spending, figure out how to increase liquidity, put it into runoff, cut costs. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to drill faster. And it's like, what? <laughs> you guys literally are like not in compliance with your covenants. Oh, yeah, we're just going to keep drilling. You know, we're going to find buried treasure. Uh, but every okay. industry, but, but industries, when this happens, it, there's ultimately the day of reckoning, and we have hundreds of billions of dollars coming due in the next few years. How do you see it playing out? I think everyone goes broke. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, from an investment, so from an investor standpoint, do you do you short certain shale plays, or are you, you know, Chris? Chris, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you see the, the collapse, the pending collapse in, in shale plays as an opportunity to own the offshore, uh, which, which I really like some of these offshore names that you like as well. Um, so, so do you get aggressive on the short side, uh, Cuppy, or do you just look for it to oh, play I don't on the long side? I don't short stocks. I've had my head handed to me too many times. Uh, you know, the way I'm thinking about this, <laughs> and I've been early, and that's my own damn fault, but... Um, if you think of natural gas, what's happened over the last uh, few years, decade really, but last few years in particular, is that you've had a lot of byproduct natural gas from Shell uh, primary oil plays. And this byproduct gas has, I mean, it's byproduct. No, no one cares what the cost is. They just need pipelines to get it out of the Permian or out of the Bakken or whatever. And so it's just coming to market and it's basically crowding out everyone else in the shell in uh, gas space. If you look at conventional gas production, it's gone way down over the last decade. If you look at guys in the Marcellus, they're even slowing down. I mean, you have Haynesville, but then you have these other uh, uh, basins where guys just stopped drilling years ago because they weren't competitive. And you have this real crowding out. What I've been looking at is the view that as uh, primary uh, sh shale guys, uh, oil shale guys who have uh, nat gas byproduct, as they start slowing down, you're going to see uh, nat gas prices improve. And we've already seen this. It's been nine months straight now where uh, U.S. nat gas production has been flat. That's usually the first step towards rolling over. It's flat because a bunch of other uh, shale plays are uh, declining. I mean, one of the things that's funny about shale is that if you don't uh, keep drilling wells, you decline pretty fast. So it's going to solve itself as these shale guys cut off. Uh, you know, I have a very large position in uh, Intero Resources. It's been one of the worst uh, investments I've made in a very long time. Uh, but they're fully hedged for the next two years, so I don't really care what happens to the price of that gas this year or next year. Uh, and by 2021, I think they're the last man standing in terms of nat gas because most of their competitors are somewhat hedged this year and not hedged next year and they're all going to go broke and when you go broke you stop drilling uh is actually making money at these prices 
and mainly because they're hedge book. But um, I think it's one of those ways you can play net gas and see what happens in a recovery. Because I do think there'll be a net gas recovery. And anytime anyone tells you that there's too much of something, and it'll never go higher, as people keep telling me about net gas, it's probably about time for it to start going higher. Well, I then again, it from it, no, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say I've been wrong for a year and a half, so <laughs> ignore me also. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, you guys know from talking to with me and and to me about uh, my view on that gas from having done the work on it with, as it relates to the uranium sector, uh, multi-billion dollar capital uh, allocation decisions uh, with respect to transitioning <clears throat> as they get out of coal and going towards that gas uh, power generation. Uh, you would think that uh, to to hear. Uh, the the utilities think about it, and that gas stays below two or two dollars, and, and and around that mark forever. And anytime people, just like you said, think a commodity is now a secular type um, investment, it, it just doesn't work that way. And well, so, if you uh, look at, I mean, if you look at that gas, just look at what is coming down the pipeline in terms of demand. You have all these petrochemical plants coming back to America. You have fertilizer. You have the switch from coal to uh, net gas for electricity. You have all these LNG. You have exports to Mexico. You just start adding up where the demand is. And then you look at the supply, and it's like, hey, guys, we're supposed to be massively oversupplied, but we haven't increased supply in nine months. And you know the weather hasn't really cooperated, which is partly why uh, you know gas prices are down. It's partly sentiment. Everyone thinks it's too much gas. But... When you look at it and you don't look at it in terms of, you know, the average uh, storage of the last five years, but you think of it differently and you think of it in terms of uh, storage divided by usage because usage has increased quite a lot. And if you start looking at it on a different metric rather than just uh, base storage, uh, net gas right now is at some of the lowest levels it's ever been in terms of storage. Uh, you know, like we have a bit more than last year, but usage is up also. And so if you have any sort of shock in the system, a cold winter, a uh, you know, really hot summer, whatever happens, I think you can have some fireworks, particularly because uh, demand keeps growing. So, both of you guys, so one of the things when you when you make a living t taking the other side of convention, in other <laughs> words, where it's called contrarian investing, a lot of the times you sit around and you say to yourself, what are these people stoned? What are they, what are they thinking about? And when I think about stoned, I think, uh, Cuppy, about your, uh, you have a website, adventuresincapitalism.com. And I, I went on there on and July 15th. You posted something I thought was hysterical and really poignant. And it was called oh, Stoned. And you talked about the cannabis sector. And I'm just going to read a brief uh, excerpt from it. It says, you have the economics of growing celery with all the government regulation of an HMO, complete with the regulatory risk of manufacturing pharmaceuticals with a two-tier system of legal and illegal producers, where legal prices are dramatically more expensive with hundreds of entrants funded with billions in equity capital who don't care about near-term economics, all locked in a vicious price war focusing on gaining market share. If it sounds like an insane place to invest, that's because it is particularly as demand is stagnating. You'd have to be stoned out of your mind to want to own any of these companies. Now, I don't know the cannabis space at all, but it, 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 just share with investors what your thoughts are there. I think you just summed it all up. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go down, you want to drill down a little deeper or, I mean. Yeah, it, uh, sure. Uh, look, the cannabis space, there's going to be some huge winners. There's going to be a lot of losers. I don't think we're at the part yet where we figure out who the winners and the losers are. Right now, it's just a giant land grab. What's crazy, though, is that everyone's throwing money at this land grab and no one can make money. And you need to eventually have some consolidation, some real losers, and you need to figure out who's going to be the winner. But everything's priced as if they're a winner right now, which makes no sense either. The thing I'm queuing off, I have a very good friend in the cannabis industry who made an amazing amount of money as an early entrant. And so he keeps giving me updates and he just keeps saying, you wouldn't believe how much supply there is. Just there's so much inventory. No one knows what to do with it all. I mean, it's called weed for a reason. It just grows like a weed. And so no one knows what to do with all this inventory. Like you look at Canada and it's what, like 20 months of supply, yet every major producer is talking about five-fold increasing supply. And so with a lag of about a year, you got to build a greenhouse, plant some plants. You just have more and more supply and no one's making money at this now. 
it, it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse. And a lot of these companies have uh, debts. I mean, they, they've raised a lot of capital, but they've lit it all on fire. Uh, I, I guess the, the going joke around our office is cannabis stocks are getting smoked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not that good. But, you know what, no, it's pretty good. <laughs> but but uh, but on our you know chat, what I group, think it is. It's like it's a, it's similar to the shale where you've got to keep going. It's like you got to keep running on that treadmill to kind of keep ahead, which just keeps you, uh, you know, keeps the the equity capital coming in so that you can get, keep the lights on. But you know that you're just running towards a, a, a closed door, you know. And it's like it's similar to the shale where these guys have to keep production up even though they know that their decline rates are, are, are you know, significant, and even though they know that they're actually losing money on every, every well that they're drilling, it kind of like, there is no, there is no solution for, for a product that you're producing at a loss. The only solution is to lower your CapEx and OpEx to the point where it is profitable or for the price of that, of that ultimate good to rise significantly enough for it to be profitable. That's the only Chris, solution. Chris, I'm gonna interrupt you there. Uh, the product's the shares, not the weed. Yeah, in this instance, which is, which is <laughs> well, I guess that brings us into the next sort of thing. You know, we, you mentioned that you don't like shorting and, um, and you know full and well that we tend to shy away from that as well. And, and so, you know, it's kind of easier for me to look at stuff and say, well, what's the secondary effect? You know, what's the second order event of, of pot stocks, you know, um, collapsing? <clears throat> I don't really have one. I just know I don't want to be near that space. I do think that coming out of it, I want to buy the snot out of, um, you know, the, the, the guys that do remain because you're going to have a, a whole lot of guys who just get wiped out and we're going to, we're going to have what exactly what happened in the alt energy space, um, in my humble estimation. Um, so you're going to have probably 70, 80% of these things blow away. You'll have massive consolidation. Somebody, a bunch of companies will retain that market share. They will become the Coca Cola's of the industry. They'll basically be branding marketing companies and they'll have set up decent distribution chains and they'll have managed the regulatory environment. And they'll be the winners and nobody will give a shit and they'll be printing money and they'll be paying out strong dividends and still nobody's going to give a shit. And that's when I want to buy them. Um, but we're a long ways off that. So in the interim, it's like, I don't really know what to do with it other than just look at it and, and giggle a bit. Um, <laughs> but in, in shale, shale is kind of more interesting because the knock on effects of shale are actually much more significant. Everybody got this linear assumption and that feeds into what you're talking about natty gas right everyone's like no we're gonna have plenty of supply of natty gas well okay where does natty gas come from you know well that's a huge um source of supply and you know is that is that is it reasonable to think that that's going to continue i don't think so you don't think so um i mean look w when you look at the production of of shale <clears throat> the, they have to just keep going fast it's not even just staying on the hamster treadmill they have to go faster and faster. Um, if you've got like the drop off rate on some of these things is 70% in the first year, 40% in the second year and about 30 in, in year three. Um, and also like, let's assume that all the company wants to do is just to maintain its year one production in years two, three, and four. So if you've got, let's just say for shits and giggles, 10,000 wells drilled in the first year, all at once, <clears throat> then the company's gonna end up with say 10,000 barrels in the end of year one. But to maintain production at the end of year one, they're gonna to have to drill 7,000 wells. And then end of year two, 6,100 wells. And end of year three is gonna be five, five and a half, something like that. So it's just like <clears throat> on top of what they've already drilled, it doesn't, you, you, can't, you can't fix this stuff. And so, um, it's similar to the cannabis space. You know, these guys are trying to keep, they're trying to grow market share. And in order to grow market share, they're just basically growing more weed, <coughs> acquiring more acreage and so on and so forth um, on, on fundamentally broken economics. So it's inevitable that it's going to break. It's just like in cannabis, I don't really know how to play that. I mean, shorting's kind of a tough gig. Um, but in, in shale, it's like you can see where, where, you know, when that narrative breaks and people go, oh, holy smokes, this stuff didn't ever work. 
it never did and it's kind of not going to work now then natty gas suddenly you know you it's there's the potential that we have the same insane um linear extrapolations take place but on the other side where suddenly people go oh my god we're never going to have enough natural gas and then what's what's the price you're going to pay for that or oh shit we really need um you know good old fossil fuels um and offshore oil because it's not coming from shale um and look again there's there's nobody left i mean there's just literally nobody left in that space so that's how we tend to look at um, identifying opportunities and what it typically means is that you you're lowering your risk because you tend to be buying these companies which are have already been through bankruptcies um you know plenty of ceos have already left <clears throat> pink tickets have been handed out all the debt holders got wiped out equity holders are all pissed there's very few of them left and um and at the same time a lot of the companies are actually profitable so you got these hugely capital intensive businesses sitting out there no one really gives a shit about them there's very few of them left um and so you can sit on those for quite a while without worrying about that short termism in the market and, and you know what what um, what happens uh, whereas with you know with like a put option well you've always got expiry right and um and you've got to keep rolling it i mean like perfect example we're all you know, we're all massive bulls on Tesla. We think Elon Musk's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, you know, so, so um, that's bullshit, of course. Um, he's a complete waiting, charlatan. Yeah. But, but you, you, you're going to, um, you, you know, you, you can short that, but you've got to keep rolling those positions because that market narrative, continue, like he keeps pulling shit out of the hat. You know, um, I mean, the latest one is is going to wire our brains up with. Um, some have really you guys? So let's difficult. talk about that for a second. Cuppy, have you in your career ever seen anything like the carnival barker that is Elon Musk and what he's perpetrated uh, uh, on the capital markets? It's it's just amazing. I don't get it. I haven't gotten it. I've made a bunch of money actually just trading around it, but. I, I, I just don't get it. I mean, it's a giant fraud and he just makes stuff up. The regulators have abdicated any responsibility for doing their job. And I don't really know who these retail guys are who buy it. Like at some point they have to realize that if you're going to lose a couple hundred million dollars a quarter, probably going on a billion next quarter, and uh, it's just not sustainable. I, I'm at a loss. They're the same people that bought housing in 06, mate. They're always there. But a house is real. You can like look at it, touch it. Like they, they must know this well, thing. They're the same guys that bought the dot coms in the in the late nineties, early two thousands. I mean, but I think the difference with this the, one. The thing with me though that blows me away here is, you know, Chris, good point. The dot coms, but eventually, when page views slowed down, or when uh, less eyeballs were there, when the numbers started to go, people started to bail, and here. I've never seen anything like it where numbers be damned. You might have a day or so where it's down a little bit, but then the narrative shifts to things that are nonsensical, to things that are going to require such capital investment that they'll never come to fruition, yet he's able to change the narrative. And and I've not seen anything like that. And 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 realism be damned, right? Whether or not it makes any sense. How about going into the last quarter? Think about this, the stock's sitting at around 170, and who knows where the margin calls are, but probably not too far where his fi he could financially collapse. Yet, going, what, four or six weeks before the quarter ends, the leaked executive email to the website mm -hmm. that is basically a promotional website for them, all of a sudden, that leaked email about deliveries, you don't think they knew they were dropping prices like a rock, and you don't think they had, they knew what those numbers were going to be. But it, he gets the stock up to 260, 270, which gives him more cover for when the shitty numbers come from a margin call perspective. That that if people don't see through that, or the regulators don't do something about that. To me, is mind numbing. Regulators gave up long ago. Yeah, I think so. That, that's a sad. That's funny. I went, on that. 
I went to go and watch um, Spider-Man with my son the other night. He wanted to go and watch Spider-Man. Yeah. So yeah. I took him and a couple of his mates to watch Spider-Man. I'm sitting there watching this thing. Um, completely shit movie, but I guess I probably would have liked it when I was 14. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and they're talking about um, Iron Man, right? In yep. the movie. And, um, and, and he's this massive, he's now dead right in the story. So, um, but they're looking back on how wonderful he was and all this kind of stuff. And, and I was sitting there and, you know, I couldn't, you know, everyone kind of compares Musk to Iron Man. Right. And I was like, you know what it is? It's just like the, the reason that my son and when I was 14, like that is like, we all want a hero. We all want fucking Iron Man. You know, it's like, that is, he's a cool dude. You know, he's just like not unbeatable. He can do all this stuff. And, and, you know, people want, people want someone like that. Um, and Musk basically gives it to them, you know, um, and yeah. these types of people exist in the world, um, you know, to a certain extent on the really, really bad end of the spectrum, they're, they're, the, they're your Hitlers, right? Um, yep. Hitler came in at the time and he gave people what, what they kind of wanted, you know, um, they'd come out of, World War Two, and they were paying reparations, and you know, basically, life was pretty, pretty shitty, and um, the economy is kind of tough based on a lot of those those things that had taken place previously. And he he gave them what they wanted, which is, hey, it's not your fault, and I'm going to make things better for you and everything else. And he used all these narratives to get himself into those position, that position of power. And Musk does a lot of that. I'm like, fucking, he uses the you know the climate change global cooling global warming pick whatever the fuck you want narrative right anytime somebody attacks him um while he flies around in his jet of course and lives in his six houses or whatever i mean you know and so um he uses that narrative he uses literally anything that's taking place um at that present time he's he's a master of i think identifying you know, those sorts of opportunities and, and really going in and um, um, sucking the most juice out of them. Um, and it's interesting because he's not particularly eloquent. In fact, he's awful, but he uses I that as well. He's kind of like, oh, I'm like I the geeky. Think, I, I think that's I his play. It's, it's like, a, this, yep. yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, and he, he he's kind of like the geeky, um, awkward guy. And, um, and so people, as a consequence, they let him get away with things that don't make any sense. You know, when he stands up there and he talks about things um, in, it could be in the medical space, you know, like now this neuro, I mean, there's a great article, um, people can Google it, written by a neuroscientist who didn't, he says like, look, I don't know anything about Musk, but this is what I do know. And he, and he writes about this article and he basically just rips him apart. He's like, this is complete rubbish this, this this is what he's talking about it doesn't work won't make doesn't make sense like he just rips it apart and he's just doing it purely from that sort of medical perspective but the interesting thing is that, that doesn't matter because most people don't really want the truth they don't actually they don't and they're not going to read that guy's article which you know is buried on page 50 of google or something like that but they will read you know front page news about elon musk um well but and Jack Nicholson, it's like in, in the Jack Nicholson invented been. that. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth, right? Well, well no, it was, you, what was it in the big short? But they said, what was it? They said, um, truth is like poetry, and most people fucking hate poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and, and here we are. All right, let's take yours for a second. So, yeah, sure. So... Uh, Guppy, you do some more, I mean, you, so you have Praetorian Capital, and I think I read somewhere in the first five years, every dollar invested on day one would have been worth $26 before fees. Um, not bad math. Um, and you re recently reopened it, and you do a lot of macro stuff. And, and I was thinking about macro, I think we were talking over the weekend, the three of us, and Raul Powell from Real Vision had put out a tweet, and Raul's, he's got an excellent website, and he said there are only three PMIs in the world, uh, purchasing index, manu uh, manufacturing index, in the world that are uh, above 50 
India, Brazil, and the U.S., all three are decelerating. And a reading below 47 usually signals a recession. All PMIs are falling very fast currently, and a global recession is just a few months away. And they did, they've, they've spent the last couple of weeks uh, doing a feature on that. Uh, um, and uh, so what? how much, for both of you, but Cuppy, how much does the macro play into it for you? And how do you factor that into your decision making and sectors you're looking at? And, and what are your overall macro thoughts and your thoughts on the market? Well, the macro is everything, really. Um, you know, if, if the macro is coming at you in the face, it doesn't matter what's going on. If you have a macro tailwind, some of the dumbest things you do usually get bailed out. And I mean, the macro is the most important. You, you look at the macro first and you figure out, you know, how to play it. I actually spoke with uh, Raul as part of our, uh, as part of his series. I was speaking with him about shipping. And I think he's spot on in terms of uh, what's happening. And it looks bad out there. It doesn't guarantee you of a recession, but it doesn't look very good. And you know, in terms of uh, how you play that, um, you know, you want to be positioned with the macro at your back. So you want to be in sectors where things are getting better. And just because the PMIs are rolling over doesn't mean that there aren't going to be winners. Uh, you know, shipping, like the Baltic freight is at uh, multi-year highs right now. Uh, yeah. Trade wars are good for shipping. Uh, IMO 2020 is good for shipping. You, you yeah. want to be in places where the wind's at your back. You want to be at places where you think there's going to be an inflection. Uh, you know, just because uh, U.S. GDP or global GDP is rolling doesn't mean there's not going to be good places to play. And, you know, of course, when the economy rolls over, guys can make a lot of money short, but shorting is very hard. And, you know, the most you can make is 100 percent. And buying puts is hard because you have to pay a lot for them. Usually when the right time to buy puts comes up, uh, the guys selling you puts know about it. So I mean, they, they charge you a lot for those. So I'd rather find things that are going to go up a lot. You know, you, you've been pounding the table on uranium, and you know, I think you're probably right about that. And it's another situation where it doesn't really matter what's going to happen uh, to global GDP. If a utility needs uranium, they just need uranium. They're not going to yeah. shut down the plant because, you know, they're not willing to pay up a dollar. So yep. you just need to be looking for places that are inflecting or tailwind and get out of the places where it's a hurricane. So how much in your portfolio, from a portfolio management perspective, where you don't short, you don't buy puts, do you use cash as your hedge? Yeah, I use cash as my hedge. I, I own some uh, Tesla puts. Uh, I broke my rule well, once. Just, you, you can't help yourself on that, right? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's almost un-American not to. Um, yeah. And I got my little but, cannabis basket, but little's the key word. Uh, right, but, right. Yeah, uh, you know, I own a lot of cash right now. Uh, you know, I, I run a fund. Uh, we, we usually six to 12 positions, uh, very concentrated positions. And you know, the good thing about how I set up my fund and my strategy is that if I sit in cash and I underperform the market, I don't care. Because most of the money is made those two or three shots each year, every two years, where you can do something really, really smart and take big positions. And the rest of the time, if it's not completely brilliant that you can't just draw on the back of a napkin, it's probably not worth doing. And you just wait for those setups. And yeah, I'm sitting with a lot of cash. I'm sitting with my Tesla puts. I have some longs and things I like, and I'm waiting for the layups. What does Buffett always say? You don't, it's a great, investing is a great business. You never have to swing. You could be a bat and never have to swing, right? You wait for your pitch. <laughs> That's true. Chris, how do you think about the macro? I know you're a big macro guy, but when you're thinking about portfolio that you and Brad run, the portfolios you and Brad, Brad McFadden run, how do you guys position, uh, think about the macro and how does that get incorporated into how you express the view in the portfolios? Yeah, so I guess there's two ways that we look at it. The first is, 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 is along that macro line and we try and figure out what's going on. And, and most of the stuff is kind of, Look, it's easy. What's that old saying? Where you know um, a good economist can see what see what's coming, and a great economist can see the second order events of what's coming. And so, you know, you, we almost always will look at what's the second order event. You go back to shale, for example. Well, you you know, you could look and go, okay, we well, can short that. Um, that's not the way that we prefer to do it. We like to look at what's like what has happened as a consequence of shale. Well, as a consequence of the massive amount of um, shale oil that's been brought on um, offshore. Oil drilling, for example, has absolutely collapsed. Um, a lot of other sectors have absolutely collapsed. 
um, the the because of the supply that's been brought in in the natty gas space, um, a lot of the players in there have been um, smashed, and so those those are more interesting to us to to do that to play that from that side of things. Um, the other the other angle that we look at is typically we'll just look we'll trawl through and look for stuff that is that is absolutely hammered and not really on an individual basis because you can always find an equity that's been smashed and it could be because the CEO yep. ran off with the CFO's wife and you know, <laughs> stole a billion dollars or God knows what. But when you find an entire sector that looks like that, then it's like, uh-huh, okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, and, and that could be anything. It could be, you might find that it is like literally, you know, um, buggy whips and, and it's gone away and it's, it's going to be replaced by something else. On the other hand, um, when you come across things like shipping, for example, you sit there and you scratch your head and you go, huh, okay, even if we had a recession, um, even if we had a gr like a global depression, are we still going to ship goods? Yep, probably. Um, and so you start looking at those and you factor that into your equations. And, and so we look at it like that. I mean, the other thing, you know, coming back to Raul's um, uh, you know, thesis, if you will, <clears throat> On um, on on a you know, what is this? He's basically calling for a global recession. Um, that's when I think about that, and then when I think about what's taken place in the certainly since the GFC and even prior to it, but but especially so since the GFC, the central banks have seen like they've had a chance to play with tools. They've played with their toys and they kind of in, you know post GFC they basically had sat back and they clapped themselves on the back and we shit guys we fixed that that we came close and so um, my estimation is that they already have tried those tools and they're going to use them even more so really just because they don't really have much else that they can do and so uh, from that perspective i'm actually pretty reluctant i'm not like i'm not long you know the spoos or the or, or you know the DAX or anything like that, but I also don't want to be shorted because I don't know what they're going to do, right? Can they come out and just start buying up all of the, the ETFs? Sure. Why the fuck not? Um, can they, you know, I mean, they've been buying up the bond market. European bond market is completely broken because that's all they've been, ECB basically, you know, controls that. So I'm reluctant to do that. But what, well, then when I think through, um, you know, what is it that, how does that end? I kind of think it feels like it ends with a stagflation. And so when you, like people talk about, oh, there's never going to be inflation. And I shared with you guys the other day when we were chatting um, uh, a post from Kevin Muir, where, you know, he was giggling and laughing and saying, well, he has two covers from, one was from Barron's and the other, I can't remember what the other um, financial publication was. And the one was all, you know, in, is inflation dead? And the other one was, um, you know, negative interest rates, the spiral we'll never get out of or something of that nature. Anyway, um, when most people think about inflation, they kind of think about demand-led inflation, which is what happens when an economy booms. And that's because that's in the more, more recent history, that's what we've experienced, right? Um, and I think that this time, the inflationary pressures can actually just come from rising um, costs and actual shortage of, of goods. Um, you know, when you think about uranium, Mike, so it's like, is that an inflation deflation? You go, no, it doesn't matter. There's, there's, a, there's a supply deficit coming. Like, it doesn't matter. The only way it gets fixed, you know, so... And, and when you look at a lot Inflation of these Inflation in the um, commodity sectors, comes because of a shortage in the commodity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in that environment, does it really matter what the Fed do? Does it matter? Like it does in, in so far as um, it can. Well, firstly, if we go back to uranium, the, the price has to rise for the utilities to actually um, well, for the miners to actually bring on supply, which the utilities um, have to have, otherwise they turn the lights out and then the business goes away. And then what's 11, 12% of global energy supply just turns off and we're all fucked. And that's not gonna happen. So, you know, the alternative is okay, the price has got to go up. Now in that environment, if the government came, if the Fed came out and started 
um, you know, pumping more liquidity into the market, would that benefit? Yeah, probably on a, on a you know, um, percentage basis, it probably benefits it more insofar as you're, you'll, there's a potential that um, more capital goes into those equities as opposed to less. But, um, it, you know, they can't affect, they can't, they can't change what's going to happen because of actual physical supply demand deficit. And so that, and, and so what people forget is that you can have easily a declining economic growth and you can still have shortages. I mean, shit, all you need to do is look at Venezuela or Zimbabwe or Yugoslavia yeah. in 03 or, you know, so like, you know, there's, there's currently this interesting narrative that, oh, we're going to have a session and it's a popular one and probably, yeah, fine. But like, I'm like, I don't, to a certain extent, I don't really care. Um, so if there's a recession, people go, oh, well, well, you know, we're not going to need any copper. The copper's going to go off. And, and like, I'm like, well, hang on a second. Like, just first, like, dig a bit deeper, right? And so um, maybe that's the case. But if you dig down and you see what the supply demand structure is, and then you go back and you can have a look at previous recessions, for example, um, that's not always the case. Um, so, and, and you, know, you know, the other thing, th th there's... There's an interesting thing that takes place, and it's it's really taken place in the energy space. There's this massive narrative that part of it's climate change, and part of it's, um, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different puzzle pieces essentially. But essentially, you got people saying, okay, we're not going to really use use fossil fuels um, going forward, and by you know, and they'll pick a date. It's going to be you know, um, 2030 for ICE vehicles, and after that, we're going to get rid of this and get rid of that. And then you go and you say, okay, well, if that's the case with oil and you break down an oil barrel and you realize that there's uh, um, about 20% of it's gasoline, that goes, I think it's 20%. And then there's a whole lot of stuff that it goes into, which it got nothing to do that. And, and those industries are not going away. So then you go, you realize that oil's not going away. That's one thing. Um, and the other is that when you have a new energy because they the, and there's the other narrative that oh we've got wind and we've got solar and we've got all these alternative energies you know that are getting better and better and yes they are getting better and better and they are making up more of a global energy pie they are taking up a greater percentage of that global energy pie but when we have new energy sources when when man finds new energy sources an interesting thing happens we find ways to use it. So the pie grows. And, yep. and, you know, a perfect example is coal. Like, you know, everyone was like, oh, coal's going to go away and we're not going to use coal and da, 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 da. We're still using coal. Um, what well, as and, and a percentage a, of the energy mix, it will go down. But on an absolute absolutely. basis, as energy demand grows, coal's going to stay flat for the next period of years. Yep. So people, right? Yep. I mean, that's, it's not going anywhere. Well, this happened with with um, with wood. I think it was like in the 18th century. You know, we were burning wood, chopping down trees for um, yep. for energy, and then we found coal, and it was like, bloody hell, this stuff's amazing. This is ridiculous. It was so much better than wood. But guess what happened? For the, like the next 80 years, wood consumption stayed actually grew. Right. It actually grew. The, the, so, and, and, and the reason is that we just found more uses for the energy. Suddenly we had like the steam engine came along and all these other things. So it's, you know, when you come back to the situation that we got today, there's a very, very strong narrative that we're not going to utilize any of this um, um, you know, oil and um, uh, we're not going to use it to the extent that we, that we should. Um, and and it's just wrong. I mean, I think there's, there's what's it, Amara's law, which is we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run, short run, and then we underestimate the effect in the long run. And that's exactly what what I think is taking place. And it it lends itself to enormous opportunity in pretty much everything that we've been talking about today. Um, yeah, let's let's you know. go back to what you said earlier about copper, and and we're not singling out copper. Just I think it was a, it's a good example for what I'm going to ask you is. Uh, you say, wait, you know, people see recession in in today's investing environment. And I, I've seen it change a lot over the 25 years. And I, I, it seems it's much more of a ready fire aim market than it is a ready aim 
fire market. So it's shoot first, ask questions later. And <clears throat> so from a portfolio management standpoint, and you too, Cubby, yeah. uh, when you see things that you think are not going to happen, so you take that second level of thinking, right? Because so much of this market moves on headlines and it moves on first level thinking versus what is that second derivative of this? How how do you guys, and, and uh, timing is always tricky, but let's say you see something like that where you say, well, wait a second, and that's not going to happen, but money flows are coming out of a sector. How do you, What's and this is much more of an art than science, how do you guys think about that before deploying capital into a sector where the first level of thinking is going to sell it off, but you know that ultimately it's not, going to play out that way. So how do you guys think about that from capital deployment standpoint? I think Cuppy and I do quite different things. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot with, with how we go about it and then you can follow up Cuppy. So firstly, part of this is, is a psychological, you know, um, bending your own mind. So, <laughs> I'll take a position in stuff largely because if I don't, if I'm not involved, I just tend to be lazy. I tend to not pay attention to, to the extent that I should. And so if I'm involved, then I'm, I'm involved. And, and, and it's just, it's again, it's a psychological thing. It could be like a few hundred bucks. It's like, it could be absolutely nothing, but I've, I've just, I've got it in, in my portfolio. It's sitting there. And it's on my watch list. And so I'm going to pay more attention to it. So that's one thing that, that I do. And that's really just um, in order for me, because here's the risk for me. The risk is that I, I get lazy. I get busy with other things. We've all got busy lives. We've got a lot of things that we're looking at. And then I wake up two years later and I'm like, Jesus Christ, I just missed a 300% move. And I, and damn it, I saw it. What the frig is wrong with you, Chris? So, so, and I've done that before, right? So I'm trying to like check myself from it from doing that. So I'll take a very, very small position just so that I'm kind of in play, if you will. Um, and then, you know, we take a lot of um, position, like if we're not that concentrated, so we'll take a sector, for example, that we like and across that sector, then we'll say, okay, we'll take, we, we want to have, firstly, we want to have the ability to stay in the game. So we're going to look, for example, for equities that don't have a lot of debt that are cash flow positive that are that basically they're not going to go away. So these, and they might, they may not get us like a five X return or something like that, but these things are solid. They're in the right space. Sure. They might go down 20, 30%, you know, on a, on a broad market move or the narrative is just really shitty for the particular sector. We're okay with that because we know that they're not going to go away. Like we're not yep. looking at a Tesla. We're not looking at, at, a, at an Uber or, or something that just literally burns money and is re heavily reliant upon capital bond markets in order to, to stay alive. So we'll put some capital into those and then we'll, then we'll structure a, a, a you know, portion into much more risky plays. So that our overall positioning, um, we could lose you know, maybe 25% of that positioning in that sector. <clears throat> and it doesn't really matter because when they really move, they move and then you're up three, four, five, ten, 10, right. depending on what it is that you're buying times. So that's kind of how we'll look at it. And then each sector that we get into, often that's like maybe 5% um, as a weighting. That's kind of like a full position for me on a sector. Mm -hmm. um, so across a portfolio, if I cock up, or like I could have a sector that takes longer from, to turn around than I'd anticipate or whatever it is, but it's like, it's, it's not going to kill me. Um, and so it's kind of like, I've got a lot of different irons in the fire and they're all um, structurally sound. Um, and, and I just kind of just sit there and wait for them to pop um, and then take money off the table as, as that occurs. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we manage Glenorchy capital and like largely how we talk about, on the research side, but I know you, Cuppy, you do much, much more concentrated stuff. Um, so you shoot. Sure. I, I guess start with, I agree a hundred percent with what you said about uh, having a possession, you know, nothing focuses your mind like a few thousand shares on your balance sheet. And yep. 
you, know, you got to stare at it every morning when you have your position report and you go, what the hell is it? Why do I have this thing? Oh, I have to go read those filings now. Like it makes you do the work. Um, so I run a super concentrated portfolio, which means that you don't have much room for mistakes. Uh, to start with a balance sheet is uh, the most important to me. I want something that has termed out debt, preferably no debt. I want something that's going to make it through the cycle. I'm usually looking at stuff at an inflection point. And my experience as shown by Nat Gas is that sometimes they don't inflect. So sometimes something that's bad just keeps getting worse. And so you, you need to make sure that you can see it through the cycle. Uh, in terms of, you know, in tarot, they have termed out debt. They have hedges in place. They own assets like their, up, their midstream company. It has the best balance sheet of anyone in the sector. They'll make it through to the other side. Um, from there, timing is critical. And there is no uh, great way to say when it is to buy. What I have found, though, is that you never get the exact low tick. But you can get close enough. Remember, if it's down 90% or 95%, if you... You know, you might have to pay up 10%. So you're coming into it down 89 instead of 90. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if you're right. And what I've found is that these things usually make a bottom. And there's so much exhaustion and frustration. Like, you know, if you look at something that just had its little crisis, you have a lot of people following it. A lot of guys, you know, trying to get the bottom. The Seeking Alpha guys are writing articles about how cheap it is. And then just slowly over time, and I'm saying time in terms of multiple years, people lose focus, they lose attention, analysts get uh, deployed to other sectors, uh, trading volume goes down, <laughs> you're left with just the diehards that believe in it. Uh, you know, look at uh, Greece, for instance, where I own the Greek ETF. And I didn't get the low tech, I went there two years ago now, poked around, told myself it's not ready yet, because I didn't have a catalyst. And, you know, I don't want to top my capital doing nothing. Uh, I want to make sure I have a catalyst that gives you escape velocity and can change the story just because it's cheap doesn't mean anything. And so I was waiting for my catalyst in Greece and it was obvious when they had an election that you had your change. And you know, we're 10 years after the Greek crisis, they've had many crises that are all self-inflicted and they had an election, the right guys won. And the day they called the early election was my day to buy because I knew that the story had changed. And yes, I had to pay up 10% that day and I was about 20% off the lows but it didn't really matter because now I knew that uh, the wind is at my back. Previously, you didn't know what they were going to do in Greece. They, they could have still made a mess of everything. It, mm -hmm. Once the wind's at your back, you can go. And, you know, think about it. Who follows Greece anymore? No one notices. No one cares. They called the election. And the stock, pretty much uh, the, the, the Greek ETF, it kind of does about a nickel a day. Just every day it goes up. As people start re-educating themselves about Greece, you know, I'm up almost 20% on this investment, even though I had to pay up 10% to get in. And that's in about two months. Uh, the point is you wait for some obvious catalyst. In the case of shipping, you know, I, I was able to watch shipping rates start to recover, but no one was paying attention. Everyone kind of forgot about it. So yeah, I didn't get yeah. the low tick, but I got good enough that I'm happy. And, and that's the thing. I think being a masochist and saying, I'm going to get the low and I'm going to buy uh, every tick down, yeah, you'll eventually get the low, but you might have started your averaging down, you know, 50, 100% too high. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's, no, that's good. All right, guys, any parting words? Being a contrarian is hard. Uh, I guess the, the question I always have amongst my friends and the things we always debate is, because we're all contrarians, which means uh, the danger is when a bunch of my friends say, Cuppy, you're just wrong about that. And I go, no, 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 everyone always tells me I'm wrong, so I'm right. And sometimes you're just wrong. <laughs> and yep. the, the, I think the most dangerous thing as a contrarian is when all your contrarian friends say you're wrong and you still go, nah, I'm probably right. And, and, and sometimes you, you really are just wrong. And I, I would say if I had that skill to find that one out of five times that I really am wrong, I have a lot more money today. And I think that's the hardest. It's very easy to be a contrarian. It's very hard to notice when uh, being a contrarian isn't ready yet. <laughs> So That's my parting wisdom. Mac? Mac? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think we, we, it's, you know, the discussions that, you, that we've all been having recently, we're all scratching our heads and, and um, kind of wondering about a lot of things. And I've read a shit ton of market history, as I know you gents have too. And I do think it's certainly we're in a, we're in one of the most peculiar environments ever, and that's largely by you know central bank manipulations and things of that nature. I mean, we've got McDonald's 
bonds trading negative. Like people are paying McDonald's. Like and and <laughs> you know, shit. If you're going to pay anybody to to um, if you're going to if you're going to go negative on a corporate bond, then I guess McDonald's is probably all right because there's always going to be some stupid buggers who eat that um, protein food. But you know, you've got what's it, about 40% of European bonds are trading negative. It's just like this, there's this weird, weird distorted world that we're living in that none of us, if, if we had had this conversation 15 years ago, like, and, and sat down and said, Oh, this is what the world's going to look like in 2019. None of us would have ever considered that it looks like what it does today. And, and people are all trying to figure out like, you know, is this time different? Is it, is it truly different? What happens and, or, or does nothing happen? Does it really matter that, you know, deficits are in the trillions? Does it really matter that, you know? And so I think that's, that's the biggest question over, um, over the markets from everybody. Um, and I think the biggest risk really at this point in time is that that which we've seen in the, in the recent history is that which we're going to continue to see into you know um into the you know uh, foreseeable future and that's one of deflation and it's and so um yeah that's i think that's you you know people need there's even if even if you're wrong even if even if we're wrong or i'm sure to say you know i don't know we're kind of similar thoughts but even if we're wrong around like you know um sort of inflation, things like that. If you're running a portfolio or you're running your own money and you're, you're, you know, you're basing it on this deflation into up the wazoo, it just makes so much sense that you have some sort of hedge because the asymmetry in this is just absolutely absurd. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's the biggest risk at the point in, in time at the moment, when you look across this, the, the sectors, basically the, the shit that's absolutely critical to human civilization, it's the cheapest, of, pretty much the cheapest it's ever been on a relative basis. Um, and that kind of makes sense when, when you have, you know, central banks doing everything that they can um, to jimmy these markets. It's like, why would you, why would you invest in productive capacity? It's the same as stock buybacks. Like why, why would companies even invest in this shit? Why, why, why would you invest in your own company? You can just borrow some money and you know, juice the price and cash in your options and go and buy your, you know, residence in the Bahamas. It's like, so, so that's, and that's been going on for quite a while. And the longer that something goes on, the more people think that it's actually normal and that's going to be a linear, um, linear thing. And the, the, the greatest risk in any market is, um, is linear thinking in what is a dynamic world. And, and I think that we're at like, are we at peak? I don't know, but it's, we're, you know, we're certainly at a point where a lot of this doesn't make sense, whether we're talking about pot stocks, or whether we're talking about shale, or whether we're talking about, um, you know, fake meat, uh, <laughs> fake meat or yeah, or, or, or McDonald's trading negative or, you know, the Swiss, all yield curves on curves on, on Swiss are negative now on, on sovereign. Uh, 50 30 it like you know and so you go well uh, is that like does that continue on and if so for how long and um so the way that that i kind of think about it, i'm like okay well even if that does it's just absolutely critical to have a hedge in case that's wrong you know what i mean and, and i fundamentally think it's wrong but but let's just assume that i'm wrong um like you basically built this massive house on um, and it's, and it's surrounded by fucking wildfires and you're not buying fire insurance. Like that just seems absolutely mad to me. So that's my two things. All right, man. Well, that's good stuff. Copy. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, your time. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Chris, really appreciate it. Chris is Chris McIntosh with capitalist exploits. And Cuppy has his adventures in capitalism and Praetorian capital. Chris, what's the name of your investment vehicle? Glenorchy Capital. Glenorchy Capital. Okay. All right, boys. Good chatting. Hey, thanks for having me thanks on. Thanks a lot. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Coming uh, from New Zealand was Chris McIntosh. And wherever in the world he was at this time, I think Florida 
where Cuppy was. But these are, yeah, I talk to these guys a lot. Uh, we, we, we have group conversations and chats and just, uh, you know, think about the world as, as from a financial perspective and investing perspective. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we kind of think this similarly, uh, we are a little curmudgeonly in our view <laughs> of certain things. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we are not, uh, we are not what's, uh, what's working today. Kind of thinkers doesn't mean we're, you know, that's good or bad. It just means that's how we think. Uh, and, um, you know, take a, uh, more, more, um, uh, contrarian view to things, not for the sake of it. If you are contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, you will have a terrible investment record. You will get your head handed to you, you know, for most things that are down and out of favor, they belong to be down and out of favor. And it's hard to find thesis and, and catalysts and stuff like that. Um, uh, but every once in a while you come across things and, um, you know, you just have to put a, 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 a different look at things through a different lens and then you have to that's that's just the, the beginning of the opportunity and then you have to from there you know do your analysis and um, understand your risk reward so I wanted to, to bring Cuppy and, and uh, Macintosh on and and uh, just give uh, a little update as to how they're thinking right now so hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope you're enjoying the dog days of summer and let's go Mets talk next week the information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.